Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. My guest today is an overseas citizen of India, which means she can come to this country whenever she wants. And yet a week ago on the 23rd of February, when she arrived in Bangalore to attend a conference at the invitation of the Karnataka government, she was refused entry and deported back to the United Kingdom. Joining me now to talk about what happened and to respond to the accusations and allegations made about her and her work is Professor of Politics, International Relations and Critical Interdisciplinary Studies at the University of Westminster, Natasha Cole. Professor Cole, let me start by asking you to introduce yourself to the audience. What is your connection to India? How long have you lived in the United Kingdom? And what field of politics do you specialize in? Thank you very much, Karan, for uh, this conversation. So uh, I was born in India. Uh, as I've said online, I was born in Gorakhpur. Uh, I'm originally from downtown Srinagar. Uh, I grew up in Delhi. Uh, it is, uh, you know, of course, I grew up outside of Kashmir, but Kashmir was very much a presence in my life. I was always very strongly influenced by India's civilizational values. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I've lived in India, grown up in India, went to school in India, went to college in India. I did my economics honors from Sri Ram College of Commerce. Uh, I was uh, awarded a scholarship to do my MSc in public policy economics with a specialization in public policy in 1997, after which I did a joint PhD in economics and philosophy. Uh, my first career was as an economist. Uh, over the last decade and a half, I have worked in politics and international relations. Uh, there are various topics on which I have worked on, but there are a few consistent themes, such as, uh, you know, I'm very interested in issues of, uh, for instance, in gender injustice, misogyny, uh, democratic erosion. I care for these values very deeply. I think that these values are important to protect. Uh, I have also, as an international relations academic, worked on aspects of geopolitics, um, you know, critical political economy. So uh, my my work is all in the public domain. Uh, my my uh, you know my upbringing in India was uh, in a in a usual normal Indian you know Kashmiri Pandit household. Uh, I, I carry with me the, those values of discipline, stoicism, rigor. My family has served in, you know, all of different relatives have served in, you know, the Indian state, the Indian government. Uh, my mother, uh, who's now, of course, elderly and ailing and in India, uh, was a, a, an awardee for her um, for her uh, national service from the president of India when she was a student. So I, you know, I have very strong connections, emotional connections affective connections with India and uh, I would never, you know, I, I'm not foreign to India by, by let, any means. Let me ask you, do you have close family living in India? You referred to your mother. Is she alive? Is she in India? And how often have you visited in the recent past? Uh, yes, my um, um, I have close family in India, as I mentioned. Uh, I have visited India numerous occasions. I've never had a problem like this before. I've traveled for my work uh, to various countries around the world. In fact, to maybe about 80 countries, never had an experience like this. Uh, my, uh, yeah, my, my family's in India. And the last time I left was at the start of February. The only difference, of course, this time is that it was an official invitation. So you were in India as recently as the beginning of February? I left at the beginning of February, yes. And is your mother in India? 
Yes, she is. So you have very close family and very close attachments to this country. A absolutely. I mean, even before this interview, I, I called her and I asked her for her Ashirwad. Like, I, you know, I mean, she's obviously I'm very close to my my family, and she's the only like you know after my father's death, I, I grew up in a in a single parent woman headed household. So she's obviously the only parent, the on the most important attachment in my life. So obviously, I'm, I have close. Tell me, although you probably have another passport at the moment, do you consider yourself Indian, culturally, philosophically, in family terms? Yes, there's, uh, you know, there's going to be uh, Herat, which is uh, Shivratri for Kashmiri Pandits in a few days. I will be keeping my Vatuk. I am definitely, uh, you know, I, I could beat anyone at an Antakshri. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm always, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, for the last few years, I've been a vegetarian. I can eat, uh, you know, I, I'm, I can't even I mean I can't even think of words that that I would use to to indicate I don't see belongings as com competitive it's not that you know if you if you are outside of a certain geographic geographical boundary somehow that kind of erases your memories your history that's absolutely not the case I care very much for India which is why this whole thing is so befuddling tell me can you briefly describe what happened when you arrived at Bangalore airport on I believe the 23rd of February so I arrived. Uh, so this was a very busy time for me work wise. Uh, I had to think very carefully about accepting the invitation, but it was since it was over the weekend and only for two days, I agreed. I was supposed to arrive on Friday, leave on Monday morning uh, to a, a hectic week back here. Uh, I, when I arrived at the airport, I had no idea this was going to unfold. I was queuing up. It always makes me happy, by the way, to see female immigration officials. So I was queuing up in a, in a different line, which was for the OCIs. Uh, but somebody came up to me and said, can you come over and join this other line? I assumed that that was because the line was shorter or something. So I went to that other line. Uh, when I reached the counter again, you know, they didn't say anything initially. The person uh, looked at it and, uh, you know, and his and he he seemed to kind of, you know, react a certain way. A colleague of him said, clear kardo. And but then they called the superior and uh, some official. Uh, of course, you know how immigration is, right? They, they never like give you any answers. Uh, and then this uh, the the senior official came, and after that, I was given no explanation, no reason. I was just shuttled around. Okay, come to this, uh, you know, their their own a separate kind of office, and there they just kept saying, "Sit down, don't ask questions." And I said, "Well, I've been sitting on the whole flight. I don't want to be sitting down. Please tell me what's happening." This went on for quite a long time, and I was given no reason, no explanation. I showed them, you know, the the official letter. I said, "I'm here for two days. This is the invitation." They said, "Well, we have, you know, this is not Karnataka government." Uh, thing we are under central government we have orders from Delhi we can't allow you in uh, if you have a problem take it up with Delhi I said can you give me the name of a person can you give me a telephone number can you give me someone to contact this was middle of the night back in the UK and you know before way like dawn in, in, in India uh, and then they just gave a letter to the airline, addressed to the airline, and said, "Take you, uh, you know, to to take me back without giving any reason." Uh, I tried to tell them. Then they sent me to detention. They said, "You have to go to detention wh where you are under armed guard in a confined space with a very narrow kind of bench sort of a thing, uh, constant lights, and air went overhead." I tried to tell them, "Look, I have a metal plate in this arm. I can't, you know, this is not. I can't spend twenty four hours here. Uh, it, it, access to food and water was really difficult. You're not the the." Security guards there, the CISF, don't have phones. They're not allowed to have phones. So you can't have any contact outside. I didn't have my bags with me. Uh, so just I, I tried to tell them, look, I had a cholecystectomy. I have, you know, post in 2020, I have, uh, you know, liver problems. Please, can you make things a little easier? Because I have been given no reason. I'm here as an official invitee, but none of that seemed to matter. Even something as simple as getting a cushion or a pillow or a blanket was, was you know, was they just treated me as if I was a criminal, as if I didn't have valid documents, whereas my passport and my OCI, like everything I had valid and current and everything. Uh, and and that was the, uh, and, and since then, I mean, since coming back, uh, I've uh, I've endured a, a whole lot of very horrible threats and trolling online. Okay, can I stop you? Before we, before we jump to what happened after you return, what explanation did they give you for not allowing you to enter the country and for deporting you back? You must have asked them, why are you doing this? What was their answer? Absolutely. Several times they gave me no explanation. They gave me no reason. The only reason was this is an order from Delhi. That's that's it. I was not given any reason, any explanation. I kept asking them nothing. But once I was in detention, I had no way of obviously contacting them because I don't have their numbers. They don't give out their numbers. So I can't contact them. So it was like just being in that space. And, and how, not how long were you held in detention? 
uh, up 24 hours. So for 24 and, hours, you were in a room with guards surrounding you, unable to leave. Uh, yes, they had two. They have like these cubicles, only two, two of them. The walls don't go up all the way. So there's space at the top. There's lights that you can't turn off. Uh, there's a door and there's outside there are uh, guards uh, sitting there. Did you have access to a bathroom during those 24 hours? I did have access to, a, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, you have to walk and then there's a, a, a toilet bathroom. Uh, but that, you know, even the sink, like if you wanted to, uh, uh, it, it wasn't the easiest thing. And at one point I, I really asked the guards that, can you please get the bathroom clean? Because it was really dirty. And uh, uh, so it, yeah, it, it was quite difficult. And were you given food during that detention period? So food, uh, I was given food, but uh, as I mentioned that the food was not easy to get. So for example, uh, of course I had to pay for it, but you know, but I, uh, you know, but just the process of getting it, because you tell the guards and the guards say, wait till someone passes, you know, whom we can call, uh, then they, and when that person comes, then they say to somebody, so basically from the point at which you're hungry to the point at which you, you get food is several hours. Uh, and at one point, the, when they got the food, it was outside the glass gates and the guard said, no, you have to get a letter from, uh, you know, somebody at the airport. I don't know immigration or airport to say that the food is safe to be brought in, uh, even though that was food from one of the places, I guess, you know, in, inside the airport, uh, which I was, of course, paying for. So, yeah. As I hear what you're saying, the audience will get the impression that for the 24 hours that you were kept in detention with guards surrounding you in a solitary small room, you were being treated like effectively a criminal. Is that the correct impression? I was, I was treated like somebody who'd violated some rules or who, who had done something wrong, which, uh, you know, which is, uh, which is absolutely not the case. So you were, in effect, only permitted to be in India for 24 hours, most of which you spent in detention, where you were, as you said, treated effectively like a criminal. Yes, getting access to anything was really difficult, yes. Let's then come to what the newspapers and television channels in India have been told by the government are reasons for deporting you. They gave you no explanation whatsoever at Kemper Gowda Airport in Bangalore, but clearly unnamed government sources have spoken to both newspapers and television channels. I'll take you through what those Newspapers and channels have reported one by one. I'll start with the Times of India. According to this paper, you repeatedly refer to Jammu and Kashmir in your work as India administered Kashmir. And when India abrogated Article 370 in 2019, it said you submitted written testimony to the United States House of Representatives criticizing India. Is any of that true? Absolutely not. Uh, the only, you know, the, I wasn't given any reasons, as I told you, but the only thing I was asked at immigration is that have you have you debated and criticized Ram Madhav and RSS? And uh, I said, yes, of course, I have, uh, you know, I have been on, uh, you know, I have been on that TV debate. It's, it's public. And that was 2015. And I did say that was nine years ago. What has that got to do with anything now? They did not mention the testimony then, but they did mention Ram Madhav and RSS. Uh, although it was informal, it was not, you know, when I asked them for a reason, they didn't say that, but they did ask me that. Uh, and it was the only thing. Now, firstly, it's quite bizarre that they would give reasons to newspapers and TV channels and, and not, you know, and, and which are also very specious. And it's it's a patchwork of unsubstantiated, quilt of unsubstantiated allegations. So regarding the use of terminology, well, if I'm talking about India's domestic context, obviously, historically, one would speak of the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, now the Union territories. Uh, but if you're talking in the context of international relations, that is the standard, normal, legal terminology of using administration. It's a very neutral term. It does not reflect in any way on, on any claims. In fact, it is simply drawing attention to the fact that there isn't, because on the other side of the line of control, India does not have administrative control. If and when it does, then obviously, then there would be no need to use that terminology. It is also the terminology widely used by scholars, by media, by BBC, by everything. It's online. So, uh, so that makes no sense. Uh, and the uh, what about what about the allegation that you gave testimony in 2019 to the US House of Representatives criticizing India's action abrogating Article 370? Is that true? I did give testimony and it's public and I've visited India several times since 
the uh, testimony at the US Congress, which if anyone cares to listen in full, in no way reflects. In fact, it says that, you know, a, that there is we should not have any stereotypes that countries in Asia or, you know, South Asia, India cannot have uh, a democratic system. It was in defense of democratic pluralist values. This is well before the Supreme Court judgment. At that point, if you remember, many Indians, all kinds of Indians were also asking the same question of why this kind of change has been brought about without any uh, consent and without any consultation because it's problematic. That's not how democracies ought to function. And of course, the telecommunications ban, which went on for a long time and also caused uh, significant hardship. There were numerous people who criticized that. And, uh, and you know, for, for very evident reasons that this did not make sense, putting, you know, politicians, including you know, politicians that India has, Indian, uh, you know, ruling party has been in in uh, power sharing arrangements with in prison. So it, it just made no sense. And and that is is not a criticism of uh, of a, a, a state. It's criticism of an action, which of course was also taken up in court. And this so is, if as I, I said, understand, if I understand correctly, you're saying you have used the term Indian administered Kashmir, but it is the term that is internationally used. The BBC in particular uses it. And you also agree that you gave testimony, but it was analytical and you were being critical, not of the state, but of an action taken by the government, which it is your right to be critical of as an intellectual. But you accept you did give testimony, which was critical. Have I got that right? I did give testimony at the US Congress and it was and and by the way, I should also point out that in that written testimony, which is on the record for everyone to see, I did also criticize uh, the 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 point is that I criticized the conflict and I uh, criticized also the way in which, in, including in Pakistan, minorities are not taken care of, that, you know, conflicts must be ad addressed. And I have never, you know, I have never kind of, uh, uh, you know, had some kind of uh, selective thing that, you know, it's it's only critical. I, in fact, in the test, in the in the written testimony, I also said that, you know, uh, Kashmiri pundits have been through a lot and that they should be uh, the, you know, their killings, the massacres of all Absolutely. kinds. Of people, and the, impo the important point you made is that you have visited India many times since you gave that testimony in 2019, the most recent visit of which was at the very beginning of this month, February. Now, yes. secondly, the Times of India says that you've allegedly justified terrorism in Kashmir as an armed struggle for freedom. And apparently, this is something that Pakistan's ISI has both picked up and amplified upon. Have you justified terrorism as an armed struggle for freedom? Absolutely never. Never. And, you know, I am this is this is something very important to note that e that in all sorts of cases, I have always, always spoken against violence. If you look at the, in, you know, at, at the political science scholarship on, on violence, there is a view of Hannah Arendt type people and Franz Fanon type people. And I've always been with Hannah Arendt sort of views that that, you know, violence never solves anything. As a, as a as a woman, it's very important for me also to draw attention to how the use of violence for whatever reason only increases competing militarized masculinities of including of people who claim to be acting in, in the name of liberation. I have never supported and never will I support any any kind of such action. Uh, you know, even when when a whole lot of people have been supporting the actions of Hamas right now, I have not supported any such thing. There is the, the okay. best way to get non-violent civil resistance, civil disobedience of the kind of that Gandhian principles that you build a consensus, you create dialogue, you 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 know you you achieve reconciliations. That is the way forward in any kind of injustice or conflict. Not so. Not so, so it's perfectly clear that when the Times of India has been told by the government that you have justified terrorism as armed struggle for freedom, that is wrong it is untrue it is a misrepresentation of your position taken for many many years thirdly Completely wrong thirdly the times of india also has been told that you have denied that there has been a genocide of kashmiri pundits i'll point out to the audience that as a call you are yourself a kashmiri pundit the times of india on the 27th was reporting that they had been told that you have denied there's ever been a genocide of Kashmiri Pandits. And secondly and separately, NDTV, the television channel, was told that you have said Kashmiri Pandits are a pawn in the hands of Hindutva forces. Is any of that true? So firstly, on Kashmiri Pandit suffering, my position has been consistent over the years. I have always recognize the immense suffering, the killings, the loss of home, which is a very big thing that Kashmiri Pandits have gone through. Uh, 
Secondly, I have always said that we should not get into a discourse of competing victimhoods where you see suffering in line with religion. This is something that affects Kashmiris and we should build dialogues, create accountability for the killings that have happened and, and move towards uh, you know, a situation where people can live harmoniously in coexistence. So I have never denied that. In fact, I'm on record in various places, including my publications, as saying that they were targeted by pro-Pakistan Islamist actors and they were a minority. And the exodus of that minority has is something that, that needs reckoning and justice. Uh, what I have refused to do is to say that that other kinds of religion, Kashmiris of other kinds of religion, Sikhs, Muslims also haven't gone through a conflict. That you know that is important for me because they are every human so, being. So if I if I understand correctly, you've always accepted, admitted, and recognized that Kashmiri pundits have suffered and suffered grievously, but you refuse to accept that other communities like Kashmiri Muslims have not suffered. They've all suffered. That's your position. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So so that is very important to emphasize regarding the use of the word genocide. You would uh, understand there's a whole scholarly literature around that. What you know, when when is that used? Uh, you know, for so words like genocide, words like Holocaust are specific terms with specific meanings. As a scholar, it is difficult to to use those specific terms. However, exodus, killings, targeted targeting by violent Islamist actors, terrorists, all of that, you know, killing Kashmiri pundits, all of that I have always stood by. And I think you asked me one other question, which is that they are if you just very quickly remind me you also said that they've alleged something else yes NDTV has been told that you believe Kashmiri pundits are pawns in the hands of Hindu oh, yes. forces yes I, I think they might be referring to an article of mine that, in fact, I wrote for The Wire back in 2016, referring to how Kashmiri pandit suffering is used by certain kinds of actors for, for very vitiated and problematic motives in order to gain political profit without actually addressing the underlying causes of Kashmiri Pandit suffering. In other, words, in other words, it's not Kashmiri Pandits who are pawns in the hands of Hindutva forces, but it's their suffering that has yes. been used by Hindutva forces for their own purposes. The two are very different. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. And that, you know, and that increased polarization, communalization makes everyone insecure and that doesn't help it. And, you know, it proceeds in a vacuum of, uh, you know, of everything else that uh, that addressing this needs to be. And by the way, just to respond to, to one something you said earlier, because, uh, you know, that's. Uh, there's something that I need to emphasize. The fact that I have no idea, I don't read what ISI puts out. I have no what's you know nothing, no love lost for Pakistan. But this this thing that ISI has picked up on it. I mean, we live in a world of hybrid warfare. I'm sure there's some some inimical anti-India forces sitting somewhere, clinking glasses and being very happy at how this Kashmiri Pandit woman, who's actually acting in defense of Indian democratic values, is being pilloried in this way for no cause. Okay. I, I can't I have no control over how people selectively quote me. Now, Professor Kaur, NDTV has also been told that you believe India is an occupying power in Kashmir and treats Kashmiris like the Chinese treat the Uyghurs. Is that your opinion? No, I have not said that. What I have said is that we must look at the ways in which there are similarities and differences in different kinds of conflict. Now, in this case, the similarity between the two regions is that they are Muslim majority regions that are affected by Hindu majoritarianism in, in, in the rise of Hindu majoritarianism in India and the Han majoritarianism, Han chauvinism and majoritarianism in China. That that you know, and and then there are similarities in the way in which technologies of crowd control, for example, are deployed in these regions. And I am I have I am on record as saying similarities and differences. And the differences are that India is a democracy. China is an authoritarian one party state and the, and because of that when people use when certain people when you know when there is a rhetoric in India that India must start using China style methods that is what I'm warning against that you know when people in India say oh well China puts people uh, Uyghurs in camps we should also talk about you know camps for Kashmiris that's the sort of thing that's very troubling because democracies must not learn and and, and be and you know and and succumb to the appeal of authoritarian states that's what I've said that there are similarities and that there are differences. NDTV has also been told that you are a critic of India's relationship with countries like Israel, Bhutan and China. And in addition, they've been told that you've been very critical of India's top leadership, by which I imagine they mean the Modi government, probably the prime minister and the home minister specifically. OK, so on on Israel, 
Uh, I have, uh, you know, my, my, everything I've said is in public on Israel. What I have said is, in, and this is in order to challenge anti-Semitism, I have said that people who favor strong links between India and Israel, and why should there not be, there's, there's a lot, you know, in that real important in that relationship, often say that, oh, we are learning from Israel, or is, if Israel has done it, we can do it. Or if Israel is doing this, we should also do this. That is, is, that is their rhetoric. On the other hand, there are people, and including, by the way, some critical scholars, uh, who say that, you know, India and Israel are basically just interested in persecuting Muslims because they are non-Muslims. And I'm saying that this is, that these things should not be made about religion. So I have said that the, both of these uh, geopolitical imaginaries of cooperation or of oppression actually rely upon specific anti-Semitic tropes that Israel is somehow unique in being evil and everyone else can learn from it. So that's the pushback against that. And I'm on record as having said that. The second thing in relation to Bhutan, I mean, India has a, a long-standing, incredibly strong friendship and a durable relationship with this small state. It's an example of a good relationship. I've said that. In 2010, I gave a talk at, this is before this government came to power, at the I, at what was known as the IDSA in Delhi, Defense and Strategic Affairs uh, Studies. I was invited to talk there. And I said, look, this is such a good relationship. That what is important is not to be paternalistic, but to appreciate the good values of that relationship. And I was actually really happy when the first visit of the current Prime Minister Modi was to was to Bhutan when, uh, you know, when he came to power the first time. And uh, so uh, what I've challenged is that, is the over is that we should not have uh, you know we should appreciate the legacy and by the way that legacy is is from uh, uh, you know the first pm nehru's visit back in 1950s to bhutan that we should appreciate the legacy and the good things about this relationship that has weathered a lot of ups and downs and that is an, an example of a good relationship in the arena and that we should uh, work together to appreciate the good values of this relationship and create greater security so that's what i've said on on uh, on israel and bhutan and the third thing uh, that i have been china oh china uh, i mean i have honestly i have i have just two weeks ago i hosted an event on tibet i have spoken for the rights of tibetans I have, you know, comprehensively, I have spoken of how the, the ambiguities and the hypocrisies around, uh, uh, you know, around Taiwan hurt the Taiwanese. I have supported, uh, you know, I have uh, spoken in support of the of the of people's, uh, you know, uh, struggle for justice and, and uh, rule of law in the context of Hong Kong. I have spoken for against the repression of Kurds. I've spoken against the repression of environmental and other defenders. In what the about Narendra? What about... What about Narendra Modi and perhaps Amit Shah? NDTV was told that you've been extremely critical of what they described as the top leadership of the country. I assume by that term they mean Narendra Modi, possibly Amit Shah. Have you been critical of these two important politicians? Not as individual persons, but yes, of some of their policies, certainly. Uh, as individual persons, when uh, when the Home Minister Amit Shah was undergoing COVID, I'm on record on Twitter as pushing back against trolls wishing ill of him and saying that it is never personal you know the no whether we like someone or not everyone was once a child and everyone wants something good for for their own the point is to expand the understanding of their own so that okay. it's not very narrowly limited by religion on certain things like you know a lot of people criticize everything i you know i've, I've posted on record how my experience of one day bharat was was amazing but where hate and division and you know this kind of uh, the, the what we see currently in this kind of mass, uh, you know, the the intolerance, the 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 violence, the uh, disregard for rule of law, those sorts of or any policies that that do not push back against that are problematic. And as a scholar, it's my duty and someone who loves liberal democracy, who thinks India is an amazing experiment in in that in a world where so many things you know go completely wrong. It's important to point attention okay. to that, but it's not personal. NDTV has also reported that the government has no problem with your dissenting views, but they cannot accept what the government told NDTV they see as your animus towards India. Do you have an animus towards India as NDTV was apparently told by the government? So it's 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 first of all, I mean, it's, it bears thinking why, uh, you know, a patchwork of unsubstantiated allegations have been fed to a channel owned by a corporate supporter of the of the ruling party. It, it makes no sense. Like, why would why would NDTV be given all these ridiculous things? I only saw one fragment, but they've actually said things that I've never said. There are quotes that that are not mine. 
you know uh, kashmir is a pakistan problem pakistan must uh, must finally resolve i've never said that i don't know who they are quoting for but those are not my words i have not ever spared any you know any part of the world where i've seen anything wrong do you, so do you have uh, forgive me interrupting but do you have an animus towards india as the government apparently told ndtv absolutely not why would i have an animus to uh, you know to to first of all to india the country of my birth and the country i'm very close to and secondly why it's not even it's not i mean animus it's a strange word to use why would i have a hatred i'm i'm simply as somebody who speaks truth to power it is important for me to point things out as i see them and and you know and uh, the prime minister modi on twitter said dissent is important for democracy well we can't have everyone agreeing with everything all the time that's that's the whole point of a democracy is that there is a public sphere there is dialogue and that people are allowed to express their opinions uh in and especially when it is in defense of things like uh, you know liberal demo democratic values uh principles and for you know this kind of a thing to have happened it's a state it's a state government's official invitation to a known academic and the state government is has you know so does the federal government elected by people do not no. have right to invite let, let me ask you this both the times of india and ndtv were clearly briefed by someone in government and given what were reported as the government's explanations and reasons for deporting you did either the times of india or ndtv contact you for your side of the story no that was the other bizarre thing that i saw this and i thought well how is this this is like uh, you know uh, this is a weird kind of trial where somebody is is you know is is putting forward one kind of view it wasn't that hard for times of india to reach out to me and say well what do you have to say about it uh you know it, it's it's it, it, there's no sense and also as i said there's so, there's, so i'm just clarifying this because it's very important neither ndtv nor the times of india contacted you they carried the government's alleged version but they made no attempt to balance it by carrying yours times of india never contacted me uh i got an email i'd have to check where, which specific person it was from but there was an email from somebody saying to me that i i i again forgive me but i think rajdeep sir this i works for right ndtv no he works for india today okay well anyway i got an email from them saying that we would like a 10 minute interview but shortly after that i got another email saying sorry we recall our email we don't want the interview so, anyway, this is very important you got an email from india today and you named rajdeep sardesai saying they want a 10 minute interview and then shortly after that you got a second email saying they withdraw their request is that right the email was not from him the email was from somebody i guess who works in his office saying that we want this interview and then shortly afterwards i got another email saying that uh, sorry we we don't need it but i'm glad you clarified because uh, he used to at one point be with ndtv tv so no no attempt to contact from ndtv or from uh, times of india whatsoever let me at this point professor kaur ask you as someone who was born in india someone educated in india you were a student at ssrc your mother still lives in india you said to me that you actually consider yourself spiritually and culturally indian even if your passport may not be indian any longer how then with that background do you view the way you've been treated not only are you of indian origin but you are an oci card holder which gives you the right to enter india whenever you want and that right was denied to you 6 days ago how do you view that i feel that this is really unjust and unfair it's uh, it's been uh, i mean a harrowing experience both then before uh, you know and during and after since uh, it is uh, it is uh, you know I, i i don't know if i'm the only person that this has happened to but i can speak from my experience although there are reports that say that you know that there's this this kind of thing is is uh, also happens to others but uh, in in this case i know that you know i had no intention of of doing anything contrary to any uh, you know law or anything i was invited by a state government i was going to be two days at a conference which was on unity and pluralism and uh, you know rule of law constitution uh, all good things so uh, as somebody who is an overseas citizen of india who you know who is who has who has who has no animus to india and who has been critical of regimes around you know governments leaders i don't believe in the cult of leadership i've i've criticized trump i've criticized Duterte, I have criticized Bolsonaro. I have criticized uh, criticized uh, Xi Jinping. I have criticized uh, you know Putin. Uh, I've uh, you know it's it, I've uh, it's, whichever it's the point is that if 
that this kind of thing, that it, this feels like a personal vendetta. And, you know, why would I be asked, well, have you criticized, you know, have you challenged Ram Madhav at, at the airport? And that's, by the way, something that nobody said to, said to, Indi, and, uh, you know, NDTV or Times of India, but that's the only thing that I heard at the airport. Uh, me this, Professor Gore, will you take this matter to court? I believe, and I'm told that you have the right to do so. Will you exercise that right? You know, I'd have to think about it. I hope that this is, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I know that I have good cause, but I'm hoping that it can be resolved. I don't know how, you know, uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about the details of it. But I know that what I have undergone is unfair, unjust. And it, it's, uh, you know, it seeks to sever me from India, from my family, from, you know, for for no reason whatsoever and and the constant uh you know strain of the the also since then online and including bjp karnataka people saying apparently that i've been uh that i'm pro pakistan and a pakistan sympathizer i don't even understand why is it that if as an indian if you want to speak in defense of certain things that are indian that you are labeled uh pro pakistan i mean it's unfortunately that happens very frequently in the country at the moment but let me ask you this. You're hoping the matter can be resolved. Have you taken any steps other than going to court that might resolve this issue? Uh, you know, I'm literally right now going from hour to hour. I've, uh, you know, it has been the last two days. It doesn't even feel like it's just been less than a week. I have, you know, I have, I've had little sleep. I'm constantly dealing with... Uh, you know, with with the hate that I'm getting, not just online, but also on email, with the messages of solidarity from people who you know who empathize, and with and with my usual work, by the way, which is you know I, my colleagues and you know people are really helpful, but there are responsibilities, and and I don't want to renege on any of my prior commitments. So right now, I'm just literally getting through it moment by moment. I can understand. It's something finally, that Professor Cole. Finally, whilst the Modi government is in power. And it's widely believed that it will win the forthcoming elections and get another five-year term. How do you see your relationship with India? And will you be able to return to meet your mother who lives here? The second question first, I hope so. You know, I know there have been all sorts of threats online, including that I'll be killed, etc. But, you know, but I, I truly hope so, because the, the, the alternative is, is, is really hard to uh, kind of, you know, to, to kind of Im Im imagine uh, the, the question about, well, you know, uh, who wins the elections. That's not, not know, that, who wins the elections, not who wins the elections. How do you see it, your relationship with India? In the light of the fact that Mr. Modi and his government could win another five-year term in a couple of weeks' time. It's your relationship with India I'm talking about. So, uh, my relationship with India should not be affected by what uh, party comes to power in a democracy. Uh, because that's, you know, that's that's that. It, it, the one has nothing to do with the other. I, I am, I you know, I did not seek this kind of situation. I am. I was just doing my work. I haven't even been to Kashmir in numerous years. I've, uh, you know, I've, I've, I was just doing my own thing. I was not, you know, I was not expecting anything like this to happen. So, uh, you know, I, I would prefer just to be left alone to live my life, to do my work as, as, as a, a scholar and public intellectual. And I have, as I said, nothing personal against any leaders, but also no animus whatsoever. Uh, there is absolutely no hypocrisy. You know, the easy thing to do is to take sides and only talk about one kind of injustice in one kind of place. Absolutely, the but this talk about it all. This trauma that has been inflicted upon you could actually become a personal tragedy because your mother, who's elderly, lives in India. And if you are not allowed to go to that country, you will either have to bring your mother to England to meet you or you will not be able to meet her. She's not very well. I don't know if she can take undertake that journey. Uh... <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm. I'm. I, I mean, I honestly, I, I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I just think that it would be very petty and very insecure to subject anyone like that and anyone to to a situation like this. Professor I Cole, I don't even know I, what to say to that. I, I, I hope, Professor Cole, this situation is resolved and is resolved quickly and satisfactorily. Thank you very much for talking to me and for so openly and honestly addressing all the allegations that have been hurled at you and your work and giving us your side of the story, which it is very important that the Indian people should hear. 
Thank you so much. Deeply grateful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.